Hey guys, welcome to another Elvistory video. <clears throat> um, this video is about the young romance of Elvis Presley and a girl named Magdalene Morgan. Now, they started dating when they were approximately about 9, 10 years old and their relationship lasted about a few years from 1945 to 1948. And how they met was in a church that both of their families used to go to. They used to see each other all the time and then they kind of fell for each other. But the thing of it was, Elvis was seeing this other girl called Eloise Bedford. So he kind of had to break it off with her to go out with Magdalene. And so he did. And so in this video, I, uh, I basically am going to read an uh, interview to you guys that I found online with Magdalene some years ago. And she gives a descriptive story about her relationship with Elvis and some details about his family as well. So without any further ado, I will take you guys to the story and to the interview. And I hope you enjoy it. And it, also there's um, pictures also at the end of this video of uh, Magdalene and Elvis together actually. And some other pictures as well. Alright guys, I hope you enjoy the rest of the video. Thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. Um, if you like the video when you're done, please give it a like. I really appreciate that because it helps me out a lot. Alright guys, everybody be well and... TCB and God bless. Okay guys, so I'm going to read this interview I found with Magdalene Morgan where she talks about her relationship with Elvis. And it goes like this. I guess my infatuation with Elvis started in the little Assembly of God church up in East Tupelo, says Magdalene, known as Maggie in school because people, including Elvis, never got around to learning how to spell her name correctly. He sang and picked the guitar. I sang and played piano. I was the church pianist when I was but eight or nine years old. We were always in Christmas plays together up at the church. I always played opposite Elvis, which really thrilled me a lot. One time I remember he was one of the wise men, and I was one of the angels. Another time he was Joseph and I was Mary. He was just my ideal guy. He was very pleasant and very polite. He didn't talk a whole lot. Elvis was kind of embarrassed a lot. He did not like crowds. He would talk to me a lot if we were by, our, by ourselves. Like when my mother and I would visit the Presley home, which we did often because Gladys was my mom's best friend. Magdalene said she attended a couple of birthday parties for Elvis in his home. He and I would sing. We would hold hands and talk. We would go for walks in the woods out behind his house and he would talk about what he wanted to be when he grew up. He always talked about wanting to be a singer. And he would marry someone who would have to be a lot like his mama. This was when we were 10, 11, on up in there. He was just my little guy, you know. At the time I was very young, I didn't expect my life to end or go anywhere without Elvis because he was my man. I was right there with him when he sang his very, so his very first song on WELO radio. I was so proud of him. The station was downtown, she believes on Spring Street, not above the black and white store, as has been written so often. That's incorrect, says Magdalene. There was a restaurant on that same street, Nanny's Cafe, owned by my uncle. My mom and I worked there. Well, mom worked and I piddled. The radio station was upstairs over the restaurant. The disc jockey would call down and order his food and I would carry it up to him. That's where Elvis sang his first song on the radio. I can't remember the DJ's name. It wasn't Mississippi Slim and it wasn't Roy Miller. Mississippi Slim had his own program and Newbin Payne sang with him on the show. 
Elvis did sing on Slim's program a couple of times, but that was later on. So back to the birthday parties. They were at that little house on Old Saltillo Road. There would be Elvis and his family, me and my family. We were very poor. We managed to have the usual meal, beans, potatoes, and meat, and then some birthday cake. Gladys made the cake and the frosting, and sometimes she made the ice cream in one of those old-time ice cream freezers. We had to take turns cranking it. It was a good old party for people back then when people were poor and salaries weren't very much. For birthday gifts, Elvis would receive a shirt, sometimes a handmade one made out of flour sack material. Gladys was very good at sewing, Magdalene remembers. She worked in a sewing factory. He'd wind up getting the shirt, maybe a bar of candy. Those were the good times, something we will always remember. One of his favorite candies back then was Milky Way. I know one time we were at this Christmas party at the church. His uncle Sales, which is Vernon's brother, was calling out the names of kids for presents. I had wanted a bicycle for a very, very long time. Sales called out my name, Magdalene. Elvis and I were talking at the time and I had not heard my name called out. Elvis's dad dro drove a truck then and he delivered candy and cigarettes. His employer had donated this big carton of Milky Ways and I won the gigantic case of Milky Way candy bars. That was more candy than I had ever seen in my life. Well, Elvis and I went back to talking again and once more sales kept saying, Magdalene, Magdalene, finally he said, if you don't want this bicycle, I'll give it to someone else. Me and Elvis stopped talking right away. I ran up there and I got my bicycle. That was the highlight of my day, of my life. One small problem though. The Morgans lived about eight miles from the church. How do you get this shiny new bicycle from the church to the house? There I was in a long white satin evening gown that I had worn during the Christmas play, she recalls. No way to get my bicycle home. I didn't dare leave it at the church. So Vernon and Gladys and Mom and Elvis got in the car and I got a big safety pin and I pinned this satin gown up between my legs. Up the hill we went, all the way to Martin Hill. Vernon was driving about three miles per hour right behind me. I rode my bike home. They had my candy in the car so I was very, very happy. Off times, while the mothers visited in the Presley house, Elvis and Magdalene would take strolls through the woods in the hills behind the house. There they would talk, dream, and loud at once. Elvis got up the nerve to kiss his girlfriend for the first time. We were just like any of other kids while we were together, she said. We would talk about school, church, singing. He always wanted to be a singer, always. That was his greatest ambition, was to be a singer. At the time, we had planned to go th through this together, but it changed. We were so close at the time, I just thought we would always be together in life, singing, and everything. Back then, there was nothing but woods behind the house. One day, he took a knife and carved a heart on a tree trunk, and in it, he put my initials and his initials, and then he carved, carved love forever underneath the heart. Later, he would carve the same thing into the lumber near the back of the house. He carved that one very lightly, then took a pencil and outlined it. After I moved to California and came back, I went out there and looked for those hearts. The tree was gone, and the heart carved into the house was gone. I was disappointed. I guess I had expected to find everything as it was when we left it. Though they were sweethearts from the end of 5th grade until Elvis moved to Memphis in the beginning of the 7th grade, their kisses were few and far between. Just twice in three years, actually. No, make that three, she beamed, as if the smacky lips haven't <laughs> had happened only yesterday. I remember them all, she said. 
The first time was just after he had carved that heart in the tree. The, se the second kiss, we were sitting in the swing on his front porch one night while our parents were talking inside. Elvis slowly eased his arm around me like he didn't know if this were the, the right thing to do or not. And then he just sort of leaned over and kissed me. The third time he sneaked a kiss in the back seat of the car while we were going to a church rally. I mean, that was really sneaky. Just a little quick kiss. What type of kisses were they? The, te the steamy, sensuous types flashed on movie screens around the world? Heavens no, Magdalene said. No, we were way too young for that. Our parents would have killed us if we had kissed like that. Elvis and Magdalene attended school together at Lohan Elementary School. He really tried his very best, but he didn't make the best of grades, she remembered. He was always very well-mannered in school. He never had to go to the principal's office or stand in the corner. I'm sure his mother and father helped him at times with his homework, but I never did. He was always bringing his guitar to school, and at lunchtime he would sit out under a tree and pick and sing. Not just to me, to anyone who happened to be listening. <clears throat> Excuse me. He mostly wore overalls and coveralls, at times a flour sack shirt. He did have a few better shirts. He was always neat and clean. His clothes were always pressed. Once in a while he would, he would wear jeans, but he never liked wearing jeans. He said he wasn't comfortable in them. And he didn't wear tennis shoes. He wore... Those high top shoes, I think they're called brogans. You could buy them for three dollars a pair then. Today kids wear them and pay about a hundred dollars a pair. Once in a while we would go across the highway to Johnny's and drink a Coke. Always his mother was with us. Elvis's habit of stammering while talking in public was evident even in elementary school days. To me, Elvis was always, always seemed nervous, said Magdalene. He never could sit still. He stuttered, not to the point that you couldn't understand him. It, it was, uh, uh, like he did later in life, after he got famous. He was kind of fidgety, especially in crowds. He had a habit of tapping his pencil when he talked. It was a sign of nervousness. Their relationship was not confined to the classroom, classroom or the school ground, said Magdalene. We didn't go to the movie, she said. No money. In our little church, we had a group for young people called Christ Ambassadors. They had CA rallies all over the area, and whatever church brought the most members to a rally got a CA banner. They could take it to the church and keep it until some other CA group did better. Elvis and I were always together at those CA rallies. We would go to different towns, Saltillo, Corinth, Priceville. Most times we would go there on church buses. Once or twice we rode with Aaron Kennedy, the song leader at the church. He idolized his parents and they idolized him, she said. He held a high respect for his mother and father. If they said no, that meant no. But Elvis was just a well-mannered boy to be an only child. I'm an only child, and I was spoiled rotten, and I know it. Elvis was brought up like kids should be today from the old school, with a lot of respect, no talking back, and no sassing. In the church, Magdalene on piano would accompany Elvis as he sang from behind the pulpit gospel songs like Amazing Grace, The Old Rugged Cross, and some of the older, better-known hymns. After they moved the radio station out on the levee on Sunday afternoons, I would go there and play the piano while Doris Presley, Elvis's second cousin, Sales and Annie's daughter, would sing. Elvis, Vernon, and Gladys were there many times to give us support, but Elvis never sang on those Sunday sessions. Just like I would go with him to the Saturday Jamborees and he would go sing on the radio, and I never did. There were times Magdalene and her mother would spend the night with the Presleys, and she said, after we would eat supper, 
They would make Elvis a little pallet on the front floor. Me and Mama would sleep on a pallet in the kitchen. They would move the table over to make room for us. I don't think our parents ever worried that the two of us were getting too close. He never proposed marriage to me, nothing like that. We were much too young to be thinking things like that in those days. Oh, he would say, though, when we grow up, we are going to do this and do that. At that time, if you just held hands, it was very serious. And we did hold hands a lot. It was very serious between us. I remember that night on his front porch swing and he slipped his arm around me while Mama, Gladys, and Vernon were inside. And I thought, my goodness, we're practically engaged. <laughs> you know how children were then. Of course, it's a lot different now. It was just a very sweet relationship. Very clean and very sweet. And then came the heartbreaker. The Presleys announced they were moving to Memphis. When I heard they were moving to Memphis, Magdalene said, I cried a whole a good while. I missed him. I kept missing him even after I got married and had children. I loved Elvis. I will always love Elvis. There will always be a spot in my heart and Elvis will always be there. After Elvis left town, their paths drifted apart. They would see each other again only once, and they almost made contact by telephone in Hollywood. The last time I saw Elvis, Magdalene said, I was working with my mother in the Depot Cafe in Tupelo with a touch of sorrow in her voice. Everything about him had changed. His looks, his mannerisms, but deep down inside, he was still the same guy. When we walked into the cafe, I was taking a break. My mom brought him to my table and said, Maggie, do you remember who this is? And I said, sure, it's Elvis. He sat down at my table and we talked for a while. He went over some music he was getting ready to sing. He said he had been down on Beale Street in Memphis and had been singing with some, with some people. And he now had a guitar with him with strings on it. He was really excited about what, he was what was beginning to happen in his life. I would like to think he had to come back to Tupelo, Tupelo specifically to see me. We never wrote letters. Not long after he moved, I became engaged. I didn't wait for him. I figured I was never going to move to Memphis. I figured he would just go his way and I would go mine. I told my husband all about Elvis. But he didn't appreciate it. He was jealous. After getting married, Magdalene found herself working in a restaurant in Hollywood, California. A friend of her husband's was working on a movie set where Elvis was filming. On hearing that Magdalene and Elvis were once an item in Tupelo long ago, he suggested she telephone the studio and try to talk with Elvis. He gave me the telephone number, she said. I called. They tried to give me the brush off. He was getting a lot of calls, but he had a lot of fans. I explained to them Elvis and I had attended school and church together in Tupelo. Fin I finally convinced them I was legitimate, that I was not some starry-eyed teenager, that, that I was grown up with, with an actual family. The man said he would have him call me during a break in the shooting. I was on break myself, working split shift at the Firebird. I had to go back to work. I was very disappointed Elvis had not called me. Then after returning to work, I called this man's home and he said Elvis had called me not 30 minutes after I had called him. I never got to talk to him. Okay guys, so this is the house that Magdalene referred to in her interview where she would go spend time with Elvis and his family. Now this house was originally located at 306 South Tillow Road in Tupelo, Mississippi and it now resides at the Birthplace uh, Museum in Tupelo, Mississippi. And it was moved there 2008. Okay guys, so this is the Assembly of God Church that 
Elvis, Gladys, and Vernon used to go to, and this is where Magdalene and Elvis met and basically fell in love. And just like the house that Elvis was born in, the church was also moved to the Tupelo birthplace grounds in the year 2008. And this picture seen here is Lohan Elementary School in Tupelo, Mississippi. And this is the school that Magdalene Morgan and Elvis Presley used to attend together. Okay, so this picture was what Magdalene was referring to when she spoke about Elvis being on the radio. It was a singing contest which was broadcast on WELO Radio in Tupelo, Mississippi. This was the very first time Elvis's voice was ever heard on the radio. He sang Old Shep and finished in fifth place. The contest was held at the Tupelo Fairgrounds on October 3rd, 1945, when Elvis was just 10 years old. Elvis can be seen here in this picture as the last child on the far right of the picture. 